All right, everyone, this is the History of Gaming, lesson number six, the rise of, a par of Atari, excuse me, part two. Right for discussion, uh, write down some facts we learned last class about the rise of Atari. How was the company started? You know, who started the company? Who was their first employee, maybe? How did they act when they first started this startup company? What did they do to customers on the phone? Just jot some ideas down. If you need to go back to your book, flip back a few pages uh, to refresh your memory, that's fine too. Resume the video when you are ready, and I look forward to reading your responses. Nolan Bushnell has a very hard time getting loans to build his company because an investigation in New York led to the discovery that other jukebox and coin-operated businesses were actually being backed by the mafia. This actually leads to pinball being illegal in New York City for a short while. Bushnell resembled a mafia man, right? He's very stern looking, he's a large New Yorker, uh, and no one really wanted to deal with him in Atari. They were afraid, they thought he was mafia associated. However, he ends up getting a line of credit for $50,000 to expand his company. To compete with Bally, they more than doubled the size of their company and began hiring a lot of workers from the unemployment office. Then there's some trouble within. Atari offered a fun atmosphere for workers. Workers got to play all Atari games for free, and they had cold beverages while they worked on Friday nights. However, these employees, most of whom were long-haired bikers and hippies, began to sell Atari televisions and other supplies on the black market behind the company's back. Now you ask, why would they be selling you know, their own company's products uh, when they were unemployed and Atari gave them a job. Well, workers were only making $1.75 an hour when they could take a computer or a television or any sort of appliance that Atari creates and sell it for 100 bucks a piece. After cracking down on theft and firing all those associated with it, Atari was selling Pong machines for about $1,200 up front, and it only cost them 300 to make. That's a $900 profit. In those days, it just took a long time to get patents through. That was a problem, so we tried to out-innovate our competition. One unforeseen issue was that Atari Pong machines caused interference at the exact radio frequency that was used by the Nevada Highway Patrol. Police would get close to a bar driving by and all of a sudden they couldn't communicate with their headquarters. Someone noticed after 2 a.m. it would be totally fine, and that's because that's when the bars would shut down and unplug the Pong machines. Just a little fun fact there. The Jackals. Imitators immediately began making their own versions of Pong. Rival companies flocked to Andy Cap's Tavern to discover the workings of the machines so they could make their own for their own profit. Patents took too long to process, and Atari had no way of stopping rivals from selling their own versions of the machine. Companies like Ramtech, Meadows Games, and even their old co uh, you know, company that was their uh, production company, Nutting Associates, were the first to make their own versions of Pong. Bushnell hated these rivals and nicknamed them Jackals, and found the only way to beat them was to stay ahead and invent new games. However, Bushnell would only create more paddleball games such as handball, hockey, ping pong, doctor pong, pong doubles, and quadrapong. They finally expanded to newer ideas such as Track 10, and a very primitive racing game with basic graphics and a title called Gotcha, where a player with a box chased a player with an X through a maze, inspiring a new trend of video games called chase games. Atari establishes itself as the most diverse gaming coin-operated company, even coming out with games like Maneater, to capitalize on shark mania due to the extreme popularity of the movie Jaws. In any given region, only two major coin-op companies supplied games to every arcade and bowling alley. Laws are put in place that said rival companies could not work with the same manufacturers. So if there's two major coin operators in the same area, you have to work with two separate manufacturers. Bushnell needed to find a way to combat these laws. Bushnell's next door neighbor, Joe Keenan, creates key games. 
It was a rival to Atari, and he even stole three of Atari's top men in their headquarters. Everyone in the industry knew of the key game's Atari rivalry as they dominated most regions of the country, and they had different manufacturers. However, it turns out that Bushnell and Dabney were actually on the head of the board for key games, their rival company, and that this was all a scheme for Bushnell to stay ahead of his true competitors. He owned both companies. This was a way for him to lock out his true rivals from the manufacturing companies within each region. Very smart, very sneaky move. Key Games did create a key hit with the game Tank. Again, a, pr a game with primitive graphics, players controlled either a black or a white tank that consisted of a square with a line sticking out of it to represent a turret. While Key Games was thriving, Atari was not. Their Grand Track racing game was actually being sold at a deficit, meaning it cost $1,095 to make and they were only selling it for $9.95. This was a manufacturing error on the calculated cost of the machine, so every machine they sold, they were losing $100. To top it all off, it was Atari's best-selling game that year. Key Games and Atari end up merging together to save both companies as they were running low on funds. So here's another story. The personnel lady came in with a young candidate who had shown up on our doorstep. He was this real scuzzy kid. She said, what shall we do? I said, we should either call the cops or talk to him. The kid was a dropout. He was 18 years old and he knew something. He had a spark of brilliance. One of my engineers was looking for a tech, so I gave him a job working for that engineer. The next day, the engineer approaches me and says, what did I do to deserve this? This guy's filthy, obnoxious, and he doesn't know electronics. The kid worked out in the end. His name was Steve Jobs. Jobs became an important part to the Atari company, learning the trade very quickly. However, he had a very poor reputation, something he carried with him for the remainder of his life. He smelled bad, and he treated others like idiots. Jobs was known as a 20-year-old Ho Chi Minh around the office because they joked that his facial hair looked very similar. Jobs and Wozniak contributed and aided to the process of Atari's new game, Breakout. Remember, Wozniak was that guy that worked for HP and created the personal computer, and HP didn't want it. Game Breakout. Bushnell creates this concept himself. Breakout was a reiteration of Pong in which players use the ball to knock bricks out of a wall at the top of the screen. I'm sure you've played some version of this game on a computer at some point. Bushnell knew it would be a hit, but was wary of the cost. Atari made 10,000 units of their popular games, and Bushnell made Steve Jobs attempt to lessen the number of chips used in each game to save money. It could save the company approximately $100,000 for each chip that he removes from pr uh, production. So here's breakout, the ball bounces up, hits a brick, comes back down to the paddle, bounces up again. I'm sure you've played this at some point. Jobs allows Wozniak to work on the machines for half of the bonus check that Jobs was receiving for completing the task. So Jobs asked Steve Wozniak, hey, can you help me do this because I don't really know how to remove these chips, I'll give you half of my bonus. Wozniak works 17 hours straight by himself and removes 50 chips from the machine. Remember, one chip is $100,000 saved. He removed 50 chips. However, when Jobs gets paid $5,000 as a bonus for completing the task, he lies to Wozniak and only pays him $375. He was supposed to get half of this $5,000, and Steve Jobs only gave him $375. <clears throat> I got $375, and I've never really known how much Steve got. He told me he was giving me 50%, and I know he lied. I knew he believed it to be fine to buy something for $60 and sell it for $6,000 if you could but I didn't think he would do it to his best friend. Hmm, buy something for $60 and sell it for $6,000. does not that sound like every Apple product ever created? Hmm, interesting. Atari breaks into the Japanese market. At the time, it was extremely difficult for American companies to tap into this market, but one progressive company partners with Atari called Namco. 
Namco introduces Pong to Japan and it becomes a major hit. Only 15 Pong and Breakout machines were originally sent to Japan, but at the year's end, there were more Pong and Breakout machines in Japan than the rest of the world combined. But they were not Atari Pong machines. They were fakes sold by the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia. Namco ends up being involved with the counterfeit machines and were making their own versions of Pong and Breakout behind Atari's back. Atari successfully sues Namco in the late 1970s. Okay, here's some links here if you want to try Breakout, if you want to try Tank, go ahead and type those into your web browser. Um, thank you for watching, and next class we're going to learn about the fall of Atari.